Hey, fourth graders, Mr. B, back again in virtual mode with more of the secrets of Vesuvius. Miss Lucy, you going to let me read to the kids? Sit down. Okay. Yeah. She doesn't want to let me read to you. She doesn't like to share me. Anyway, here we are back with scroll 12. It was easy enough to follow Ferox's trail. The hound was dragging two yards of iron chain behind him. The four friends and their puppies tracked its snaking path in the dust between the vine rows. Flavia tried not to think of what Ferox might do to Scuto if he caught him. After half a mile, the trail emerged from the vineyard and ended at the coastal road that marked the border of her uncle's land. There was a distant rider approaching from the direction of Pompeii, but otherwise the road was empty. Across the road and set back from it were the imposing backs of opulent villas overlooking the bay. The road from Pompeii to Stabia was not wide, but it was well paved with tightly fitted hexagonal stones. The daily sea breeze had blown all the surface dust away, and the track left by Ferox's chain ended there. Now where, said Flavia, close to tears, where could he be? Behold, Nubia pointed, Nippur, something smells. Nippur had been sniffing around the base of a roadside shrine to the god Mercury on the other side of the road. Now he nosed his way through dried grasses and thistles toward the back of one of the seaside villas. The puppy led them to a high white wall with ancient cypress and cedar trees rising up behind it. In the center of the garden wall was a solid-looking wooden door with the words, Do not enter, in faded red letters on the wall next to it. A gap had been scraped in the earth beneath the door. Flavia uttered a cry. Half of Ferox protruded from this gap, the rear half. Your dog is stuck piped a voice from above them. Flavia and her friends looked up in astonishment to see a small girl sitting on the high wall, half hidden in the shade of an umbrella pine. I've been waiting for you, remarked the girl, adding, I thought this was the safest place. Have you seen another dog pass this way, called Flavia desperately, one with curly light brown fur? The little girl regarded Flavia with eyes as dark and bright as a sparrow's. She was barefoot and dressed in a bright orange tunic. Don't worry about Scudo. He's safe inside with my little sisters. Flavia whispered a prayer of thanks. Wait, said Jonathan. How did you know Scudo's name? The same way I know you're Jonathan, and you're Flavia, and Nubia, and Lupus. You're the one who's been spying on us, cried Flavia. The little girl smiled brightly. Not spying exactly, just watching. My name is Cleo. At the sound of their voices, Ferox had begun to squirm. He was wedged as tightly beneath the door as a cork in a wineskin. Cleo grasped a pine branch and pulled herself up. I'll go get help, she offered. Wait, said Jonathan. See if you can find some strong rope and... No. Get a fishing net. Cleo grinned, nodded, and scampered off along the top of the high wall as confidently as if it were a broad pavement. Lupus watched her in admiration. As soon as she was out of sight, the four friends turned their gaze on Ferox, wedged beneath the door. Flavia almost felt sorry for him, but when he began to whimper and scrabble feebly with his hind legs, the sight of his quivering black bottom reduced her to helpless laughter. Impulsively, Lupus picked up a piece of gravel and flicked it at the animal's vulnerable rear. Lupus, don't, giggled Flavia nervously. You'll just make him angrier. Lupus gave her an impish grin. He took another pebble and fitted it into the sling Jonathan was teaching him to use. He had obviously been practicing. The stone hit the watchdog squarely on the bottom. Ferox yelped like a puppy, and they all collapsed with mirth. Ferox began to growl and squirm. This time, he tried retreating, inching back toward his tormentors. 
And this time, he succeeded. Nubia had seen this coming. As Farak shook himself off and began to turn, she scooped up Nippur and thrust him at Flavia. Hold puppies! Nobody is moving! Jonathan nodded and clutched Tigris tightly. Farrax crouched. A low growl rumbled in his chest. But before he could, before he could leap, Nubia caught his gaze, held it, and murmured soothing words in her own language. After a few moments, she slowly extended her hand, palm down, and took a small but confident step forward. Farrax growled again, but with less conviction. Nubia continued to reassure him. She took another step forward. The huge dog's hackles gradually flattened, and he rose from his crouching position. Nubia took another step. Ferox sniffed her fingertips, gave a half wag of his tail, and allowed his gaze to flicker sideways for a moment. Without taking her eyes from Ferox's face, Nubia crouched and groped in the dust. When her hand closed around the metal links of his chain, she stood again and breathed a small sigh of relief. It was at that precise moment that Tigris, squirming in Jonathan's arms, uttered several sharp, defiant barks. Ferox crouched again, opening his dripping jaws, and launched himself at Jonathan. Flavia screamed and Jonathan ex instinctively threw himself to one side. Nubia tried to hold the huge animal back, but was jerked off her feet as the iron chain whipped out of her grasp. Ferox's sharp teeth missed Tigris by a whisker. Snarling with rage, the big dog skidded in the dust and turned to attack again. As Ferox gathered himself to leap, something like a spear struck him hard on the side. It knocked him to the ground. A heavy oak staff lay in the dust beside the stunned dog. Quickly, called a man's voice. The net! Throw the net! Oh, Lucy's disappointed. She was cheering for Ferox. Flavia looked up in time to see Cleo standing on the wall above them. A motion of the girl's arm unfurled a yellow flashing net. It floated to the ground. Cleo's aim was perfect. As Ferox struggled to his feet, the net enveloped him. Then Flavia saw a young man lunge forward, grasp the net, and give it a deft tug. Ferox's legs flew out from under him. Confused and stunned, the big dog tried to right himself, but the more he thrashed, the more hopelessly entangled he became. Get back, Lupus! Jonathan scrambled to his feet. He might still get loose. Tigress! Come here, you bad dog! Jonathan gave his puppy a fierce hug. Flavia helped Nubia up from the ground. Are you all right? Nubia nodded, but she was trembling. The garden gate squeaked open and Cleo rushed out. She stood with her hands on her hips, looking down at Ferox. He's wrapped himself up as tightly as a sausage in a vine leaf, she observed. Lupus guffawed and Cleo grinned at him. As Gaius's watchdog thrashed furiously on the ground, Flavia looked up at the strong youth. He wore the one-sleeved tunic of a tradesman and had a chest and arms like Hercules. Thank you, she said solemnly. You saved our lives. The young man limped cautiously toward Ferox to retrieve his staff. Flavia saw that one of his leather boots was an odd shape. Glancing back toward the road, she saw a donkey tethered to the Shrine of Mercury. In its basket pack were a workman's tools, tongs, a hammer, and an axe. Vulcan! she cried, jumping up and down and pointing at him. You're Vulcan, the blacksmith! Scroll 13. Scudo had escaped Ferox only to be captured by Cleo's younger sisters. They had pounced on him with cries of delight. After they had bathed, combed, and brushed him, they had anointed him with scented oil. Cleo rescued him just in time. Her sisters had been about to tie pink ribbons to his fur. Now he hurried fur furtively through the vineyard, trailing a cloud of jasmine perfume and a small procession. 
First came the two puppies, stopping to roll in the dust whenever Scuto did. Then came Vulcan, riding his gray donkey and pulling Ferox, still cocooned in the yellow fishnet, on a makeshift stretcher of pine branches. Nubia walked beside Ferox, softly playing her flute. Whenever she stopped playing, the big dog began to thrash and moan. Cleo had fallen into step beside Lupus and was chattering non-stop, waving her, her arms expansively. I wonder how long it will take Cleo to realize that Lupus can't speak, Flavia said to Jonathan with a grin. They took up the rear of the procession. One of her uncle's field slaves must have run ahead to alert the farm because when they emerged from the vines, most of the household was waiting in the farmyard. Nubia's flute trailed off, and Ferex began to moan again. What happened? said Aristo. Are you all right? asked Mordecai. Where's Ferox? said Gaius. Uncle Gaius! Flavia squealed. Ferox broke his chain, and we followed him to a villa, and he got stuck, but then he wiggled out and attacked us, but Vulcan saved us. Ferox broke his... Who? said Gaius. Vulcan, the blacksmith, said Flavia, the one we've been looking for. You're Vulcan, the blacksmith? Gaius asked the youth on the donkey. But the young man did not reply. He was gazing over their heads toward the garden. There was a look of awe on his face, as if he had seen something miraculous. Flavia and the others turned to see what he was staring at. Miriam had just emerged from the garden, her arms full of ivy, ivy and fragrant honeysuckle. Dressed in a lavender shift, with her glossy dark curls pinned up at the neck, Venus herself could not have looked more beautiful. Although the farmyard was like a furnace in the noonday heat, Flavia and her friends gathered around Vulcan to watch him mend Ferox's chain. He was crouched over the chain with a pair of pliers. His one-sleeved tunic revealed tanned, oiled shoulders gleaming with sweat. The powerful muscles of his arms and chest bulged as he squeezed the link. There, uh, that should hold him. Vulcan glanced up at Jonathan and Lupus, who were gazing at him with open-mouthed admiration. Could one of you bring me a cup of water? I'm very thirsty. The boys nodded and both ran off toward the house. Flavia couldn't take her eyes off the blacksmith. Somehow his neat head seemed all wrong on the powerful body. With his sensitive mouth and long eyelashes, it was as if a sculptor had wrongly put the head of a poet on the body of Hercules. His dark eyebrows met above his nose, giving his face a mournful, brooding look. And Flavia's gaze kept straying to the strangely shaped boot he wore on his right foot. Jonathan and Lupus ran empty-handed back, uh, back out of the garden. My sister's drawing cold water from the well, said Jonathan. Vulcan nodded and turned to Flavia's uncle, who stood leaning against the shady doorway of the olive press. You can put his collar on again now. It had taken Gaius a good half hour to calm his dog and cut off the fishnet. I think I'll leave him in his kennel to calm down. Gaius stepped forward. Thank you for saving the children, and for repairing his chain. The young blacksmith acknowledged Gaius's thanks with a nod. He wiped the sweat from his forehead with the back of his forearm. Flavia was desperate to ask Vulcan about the riddle, but there were too many people within earshot, including Cleo and some of her uncle's farm slaves. So she decided to try the code word. I seen you jackass. Vulcan turned slowly and looked at her, his eyes smoldering under his single eyebrow. Then he looked back at Miriam, coming toward him with a shy smile and a cup of cold water. Flavia shivered. It felt as if he had looked right through her. Thank you, Vulcan said quietly to Miriam, without taking his eyes from her face. He lifted the cup to his lips and drank. Jonathan's sister lowered her gaze. The shrill 
cry of the cicadas had ceased some time earlier, and the hot afternoon seemed to be holding its breath. The only sound Flavia could hear was Vulcan swallowing great gulps of cold water. All of a sudden, Flavia felt dizzy and unbalanced, as if she were about to faint. She gasped and reached out for Nubia, who reached for her at the same moment. Clutching at each other, the two girls looked up just in time to see Miriam fall forward into Vulcan's arms. What in Hades? Jonathan lay flat on his back in the dust. It felt as if the farmyard court had been given a brisk shake by a giant's hand. They had all staggered. Jonathan and Cleo had fallen down. Doves exploded out of the dovecote, and the hens ran clucking out of their coop. In their stables, the horses whinnied, and in the garden, the dogs began to bark. Vulcan gently set Miriam back on her feet. Her face was as pale as alabaster. Fine dust from the farmyard had risen in a golden cloud. Now it began to settle again. Earth tremor explained Flavia's uncle, helping Cleo up. He extended his hand to Jonathan and pulled him to his feet. Uh, nothing to worry about. We've had quite a few minor quakes this summer. That one wasn't too bad. All the same, Xanthus and I had better, take, uh, had better have a quick look around the farm to make sure nothing's been damaged. Xanthus, he called. Gaius turned away and then back. I imagine you're all feeling a bit shaken. Miriam, perhaps you could ask for Stilla to prepare lunch now. I'll join you presently. Vulcan and Cleo, I hope you'll both join us. Lupus followed Vulcan through the garden, admiring the smith's muscular back and wondering why he limped. Jonathan's father must have wondered the same thing, because as Vulcan came into the dining room, Mordecai stepped forward with a look of concern on his face. You've hurt yourself. You're limping. Vulcan looked flustered. It's nothing. I've had it from birth. Please, insisted the doctor. He gestured for Vulcan to recline and then nodded at Miriam, who had just come in with a copper pitcher and basin. She poured a stream of water onto her father's hands, catching the overflow in the basin. Mordecai dried his hands on the linen napkin over her arm. Then he turned to Vulcan, who was reclining on one of the low couches. Lupus and the others tried to see what Mordecai was doing, but he kept his back to them and allowed his loose blue robes to screen Vulcan's foot from their view. Lupus saw the doctor put the blacksmith's boot on the floor and bend his turbaned head over the foot. Ah, murmured Mordecai, almost to himself. Clubfoot. Not a terribly bad case. He examined it for a few minutes and then, and then helped Vulcan put the boot back on. This could have been corrected shortly after birth, when your bones were still soft. He dipped his hands in the basin and then dried them on a napkin. It could have been corrected. Did your parents not know that? Tears filled Vulcan's eyes, but they didn't spill over. His voice was steady as he looked up at Mordecai. I don't know who my parents are, sir. I was abandoned at birth. Scroll 14. Flavia felt miserable. She had called a poor orphaned clubfoot a jackass. How could she ever ask him about the treasure now? Listlessly, she pushed some black olives around the rim of her dish. It was terribly hot, and now she had no appetite. Uncle Gaius strode in from his inspection of the farm and rinsed his hands in the copper basin. He threw himself on the couch next to Aristo and helped himself to a slice of cheese. Uh, not too much damage to the farm, he remarked through his first mouthful. A few shattered roof tiles and a crack in the olive press. I'm glad you got our message, Vulcan. I really could do with the services of a blacksmith for a few days. I hope you don't mind staying in the slave quarters. Uh, not at all, said the smith, with a quick glance at Miriam. There was another pause. 
Nubia broke the silence. Are you the god Vulcan from Muntalumpus? Vulcan smiled. No, a Vulcan is just my nickname. It's not hard to guess how I got it. I don't like it, but it's something I have to live with. Flavia swallowed. If he didn't like being called Vulcan, he probably didn't like being called a jackass. The smith took a small piece of cheese, then put it down again. I don't know my real name, he said. They say a slave girl found me wrapped in swaddling clothes beside the banks of the river Sarnus. She gave me to, to her master, and he gave me to one of his freedmen, a blacksmith. My adoptive parents didn't mind my foot. They loved me as if I had been their own son. They gave me the name Lucius, but no one has called me that since my parents died. I'm adopted too, said Cleo. She was sitting at the table between Lupus and Flavia. We're all adopted, all nine of us. Extraordinary, murmured Mordecai, then to Vulcan. Please continue. There's not much more to tell. We moved to Rome when I was still a baby. I grew up there. My father taught me to be a blacksmith, and my mother taught me how to read and write. They died a year ago, when I was 16. After I settled their affairs, I moved back here to search for my real parents. My real parents are dead, said Cleo, taking a handful of olives. Father says they died in a plague. I never even knew them. Do you want revenge on your parents for abandoning you? Jonathan asked Vulcan. Jonathan, chided Mordecai. Vulcan lowered his head, then looked at Jonathan from under his long eyelashes. No, I, I don't want revenge. I've forgiven my true parents, but I do want to find them. That's why I came to Pompeii. For the past year, I've been looking everywhere in the town, but haven't found them. So when Brutus, the traveling blacksmith, died last month, I bought his donkey. Now I can visit all the farms and villages in the area. If my parents are still here, I know I will find them. The muscles of his arm bulged as he clenched his fist. But how will you recognize them? Asked, asked Jonathan. I believe, said Vulcan, I don't know, he said finally, but I must find them. I must. Why haven't you asked Vulcan about the treasure yet? Jonathan asked Flavia after lunch. They had taken Cleo to the tree fort while the adults were having their midday siesta. Jonathan sat cross-legged on the newly built wooden platform. He was sharpening the point of an arrow with a small knife. Treasure, came Cleo's voice from the leaves above. What treasure? Flavia rolled her eyes at Jonathan. That's one reason I hadn't mentioned it. Also, I think he's angry with me for calling him a jackass. That was pretty, um, bold of you, admitted Jonathan. Treasure, said Cleo again, jumping onto the platform beside Flavia. So Flavia told Cleo all about the riddle and the treasure. That's why you called him a jackass, said Leo. Said Cleo, tipping her head to one side. Who did you say gave you the riddle? Our friend Pliny. He's a famous admiral who's written dozens of books. He told us about the riddle because we saved his life, added Jonathan. Cleo's voice sparkled. Is he a fat old man with white hair and a funny voice? Lupus barked with laughter from his treetop perch, and Nubia giggled behind her hand. He's not fat, cried Flavia, sitting up a little straighter. He's just a bit stout, like Mr. B. Do you know him? Jonathan asked Cleo. Oh, of course, she chirped. He knows my parents and often stays at our villa. In fact, he's coming to dinner in a few days. He is, said Flavia. I wish we could come too. Then we could tell him we found his blacksmith and almost solved the riddle. Cleo looked at Flavia with her bright black eyes and tipped her chin up decisively. Then I will send you an invitation. In that case, said Flavia, 
we'd better find out about the treasure. Uh, you'll find the blacksmith in the tool shed by the wine cellar, said Xanthus, the farm manager. Flavia knew the tool shed. It was a dark, cool room full of pruning hooks, plowshares, hoes, picks, and various pieces of tackle for cart and horse. When they opened the battered wooden, battered wooden door and peeped in, Vulcan was nowhere in sight. But someone had been there recently. The puppies pushed past Flavia's legs and sniffed around a newly cleared space and a half-built brick furnace against one wall. Shh, said Jonathan. Do you hear that? They all listened. From the cellar on the other side of the tool shed came a bubbling groan, interspersed with curses and mutters. It's horrible, said Cleo. What is it? A shudder shook Nubia, and she gripped Flavia's arm. Even Scuto whimpered. Jonathan swallowed and looked at them. It sounds like somebody is being murdered. Scroll 15. Flavia laughed. Don't worry, she said. It's just the grape juice in the barrels. It makes that noise as it turns into wine. Sometimes the barrels practically shout. Come on. She led them across the beaten earth floor of the tool shed and pushed open the door to the cellar. It was a vast room with thick walls, cool, dark, and musty. As they stepped inside, the damp scent of fermenting wine filled Flavia's nostrils and made her slightly dizzy. Vulcan was there in the gloom, leaning on his staff and speaking quietly to three farm slaves. When he saw Flavia, he stopped talking to them. We were just getting more bricks, he said to Flavia, nodding toward a pile of bricks. The three slaves hurriedly began taking bricks for the furnace into the tool shed. Vulcan limped to the doorway to supervise. Did you want me? he said to Flavia. Although his voice was soft, his dark eyebrows made him look quite stern. The slaves were passing bricks through the doorway. Behind them, the wine in the barrel snarled and groaned. Despite herself, Flavia shivered too. No, it doesn't matter, she said, backing out of the room. It can wait. What's the matter? said Jonathan a minute later. Why didn't you ask him about the treasure? Um, the slaves, said Flavia. I couldn't ask him in front of them. We'll have to get him alone. But as the day progressed, the young blacksmith always had at least one slave nearby, and Flavia had to resign herself to waiting. That night, Flavia dreamt of her dead mother, Myrtilla. In her dream, they were back in her garden in Ostia on a summer evening. Her mother and father sat beneath the fig tree by the fountain, laughing, talking, and watching Flavia play with the twins, now Lupus's age. Flavia had woken at the darkest hour, full of despair, knowing that her mother and dead brothers were only shadows, wandering the cold gray. Excuse me, only shadows wandering the cold gray underworld and chirping like bats. She had tried to replace that terrible image with her dream of them all in a secret, safe, and sunny garden. But it was no good. Hot tears squeezed out from the corners of Flavia's eyes, wetting her cheeks and running down into her ears. As she stared up into the darkness, she knew that she would give all the treasure in the world, everything she had, even her life, if only she could make that dream come true. The morning of the Vinalia, the late summer wine festival, dawned a glorious pink and blue. But Flavia woke feeling drained after her restless night. Nubia and the dogs were already up, presumably gone to breakfast. Listlessly, Flavia splashed lukewarm water on her face from a jug in the corner and padded out to the garden for lessons. The others were crowding around the wrought iron table, examining something. Even the dogs seemed interested. As Flavia approached, Nubia, Nubia lifted her neat dark head and called out, Flavia, come see what happen, What appears outside. Excuse me. Flavia, come see what... 
Let me try this again. Flavia, come see what appears outside Miriam. Flavia sighed and quickened her step. The others moved aside to let her see. On the table was a small wooden cage with a tiny door on one side and a handle on top. A bright-eyed little sparrow perched inside. Oh, cried Flavia, he's lovely. Where did he come from? He just appeared outside Miriam's bedroom door this morning, said Jonathan, adding, Aristo says it means Miriam has an admirer. Who is it, Miriam? asked Flavia. Already her dream was fading. Who's your admirer? Miriam blushed. I, I don't know. Aristo smiled at Miriam. A sparrow is the traditional gift of a man to his sweetheart, he said. The poet Catullus even wrote a poem about a sparrow that he gave to his beloved. He talks about the little bird on his girlfriend's lap, hopping about, now here and now there. Oh, do you think it's tame? breathed Flavia. Probably, said Aristo. Shall we see? He eased open the delicate cage door and held his forefinger just outside. The sparrow cocked his head and regarded the large finger with a bright eye. He hopped to the door and cheeped. Then he hopped onto Aristo's finger. Flavia started to lean in close, excited, but Nubia put a restraining hand on her arm. Very slowly, Miriam put her elegant white finger next to Aristo's, so that they barely touched. After a moment, the sparrow hopped onto Miriam's finger. Scuto, his eyes fixed on the feathered morsel, gave a wistful whine. Oh, giggled Miriam. He tickles. Sit down, whispered Jonathan. See if he hops on your lap. Now here and now there. Not with the dogs licking their chops like that, Flavia laughed. I take the dogs away, said Nubia solemnly. I'll come with you. Flavia felt much more cheerful. Now she had two mysteries to uncover. Vulcan's treasure and the identity of Miriam's secret admirer. There were many things Nubia did not understand about the new land she lived in. When Flavia's uncle took them all into Pompeii later that morning to celebrate the Vanalia, Nubia did not understand why the priest on the temple steps crushed a handful of grapes over a bleeding carcass of a lamb. When they went to the theater, she did not understand why the men on the stage wore masks while the women in the audience left their faces uncovered. Afterward, when they returned to the farm, she did not understand why they ate roast lamb outside, sitting on old carpets near the vines beneath the shadows of the olive grove. She did not understand how Flavia could hand her uncle a piece of bread with her left hand. In her country, this was a grave insult, for the left hand was used to wipe one's bottom and she did not think she would ever understand how the Romans could allow a wise old woman like Frustilla to wait on strong young men like Aristo and Vulcan. But one thing Nubia did understand was the look between a girl and her lover. She had seen the same look many times at the spice market when all the clans got together to trade. By the end of the day, as they all walked through the cool vine rows beneath the pale green sky of dusk, Nubia knew not only that Miriam was in love, but with whom. And that's where I think we're going to leave off this time. So until next time, uh, next time we will start with scroll 16. Okay, guys be good.